Jim of Number File fame released a video recently on his singing banana channel, sharing his favorite mega number, or number greater than 1 million. He also asked fellow YouTubers to share videos with their favorite mega numbers to be added to a delightful playlist of interesting numbers. My immediate response was the ordinal number omega plus 1, the first infinite number that I found rather counterintuitive and challenged how I conceive of number in a lot of ways. However, it feels a bit like cheating to not even choose a real number as my favorite, so after I explain my love for Omega Plus One, I'll discuss my favorite finite mega, mega number in another video, 1,008,906, and how it relates to knot theory. So first, Omega Plus One and the ordinal numbers. People often say infinity plus one is still infinity, but to that I say, that depends on which infinity you're using. There's many ways to conceptualize infinite things, and depending on how you're thinking of it, arithmetically, geometrically, algebraically, or otherwise, it can really come out differently. I'm no infinity purist, I love all the ways of conceptualizing infinity, but perhaps the most unintuitive to me was ordinal numbers, which now are so intuitive and useful to my conceptualization of the infinite that it's hard to believe I really understood most other infinitudes when I didn't have ordinals in my mind. In the ordinal numbers, little omega is the symbol used for the smallest infinite number, and omega plus one represents the second smallest infinite number, genuinely a distinct value. Even more peculiar, Addition of ordinals is not commutative. 1 plus omega is equivalent to omega, not omega plus 1. These strange properties and how they change the way I conceptualize the infinite are why omega plus 1 is my favorite mega number. So what is going on here? And what does omega plus 1 really represent? And how could this be useful? For that, we start in set theory. Sets are bags of things that care about what's in the bag but not how many copies of each thing are inside. For instance, if a set S contains red sphere, red square, blue square, then I can say S contains red sphere, and S does not contain blue sphere, but not S contains one red sphere. There is no count of copies of an item inside, and adding an item already present doesn't change the set. Before we go any further, note that there aren't any other intrinsic limitations on sets, unlike real life bags of things. Can a set contain infinitely many things? Yes. Can a set contain a set? Yes. Can a set contain itself? Uh, not in standard set theories since 1925, like CFC, but yes in set theories with quine atoms. In this video, we'll disallow self containment just to keep things simple. Can a set contain nothing? Yes. That's the unique object called the empty set, written using a circle with a slash through it. And so on. In this framework, mathematicians wanted to create something like the natural numbers so that they could create a foundation of arithmetic and something more basic and perhaps prove arithmetic's consistency. This turned out to be a somewhat squirrely objective See Hilbert's second problem for more on that. The primary issue with natural numbers is that there's always another one, just one bigger than the last. But if we're starting with sets, something that doesn't count copies of items inside, then how do we reliably construct a sequence of sets all distinct from one another? Well, given any set S, let sigma of S, called the successor of S, be the set containing everything S has, as well as S itself. Since we disallowed sets containing themselves, the successor of S is always a different set from S. That is, none of the things in S at the start could have been S itself. So when we add S to the set, it must be something new, something with one more element in it. This process of adding one new element is what plus one means for ordinal numbers create the successor set. Wonderful! Now, starting by setting 0 to be the empty set, we can create any number we want with successor sets. 1 is the set containing the empty set. 2 
is the set containing the empty set and the set containing the empty set, and so on. Though this is very cumbersome to write out in full, it has two very nice intuitions. Each of these sets contains as many elements as the number it represents, and for each natural number n, its set contains all natural numbers less than n. If you've ever worked with the Python programming language, this amounts to the intuition that the length of the range of n equals n. Now is when we go infinite. What's stopping us from considering the set of all natural numbers? In fact, we do it all the time in math. Every time we say, let n be a natural number, we're really saying, let n be an element of the set of natural numbers. In those contexts, we usually write the set of natural numbers with a capital blackboard bold n. But in this construction with successor sets, we write a small omega, and it is the smallest infinite set, for reasons I won't go into here. Here comes the kicker. Now that we have this set, omega, what's stopping us from creating its successor set, a set containing every natural number and omega? It's clear that omega isn't any of the natural numbers, so this successor set is different from omega and is called omega plus one. From here, you can keep creating successor sets to get omega plus two, omega plus three, and so on, even creating omega plus omega, written omega times two, omega plus omega, omega times, written omega times omega, or omega squared, omega times omega, omega times, written omega to the omega, omega to the omega, omega times, written epsilon naught, and so on. But all this starts with the basic idea of this omega plus one being a new set. Now, this is a good time to mention that when you study cardinality of sets rather than ordinality, all of these infinite ordinals mentioned so far are the same size. They are countably infinite. So you may wonder, what's the use of regarding omega and omega plus one as different? Well, it comes down to well-ordered sets which I will not define here, but I will describe some intuition about them. C. If infinite ordinals are to be of any use, that is within their namesake of order. Every well-ordered set has the notion of size called its order type, and the order type is most easily represented by one of these ordinal numbers. If you add two well-ordered sets, A and B, by carefully concatenating them, treating all elements of B as larger than those of A, then we may need to know what the order type of the result A plus B is. And that's what ordinal addition is intended to represent. So when you consider a set A with order type omega plus one, A must have an element that is larger than all the others. That has a fundamentally different ordering to it then a set B with order type one plus omega, which has one element smaller than all the others, but still no largest element. More importantly, the ordering of B is indistinguishable from omega itself, which you can see by just renaming that smallest element zero and starting a count from there. This leaves a lot of details out, but hopefully gives some clarity on why I initially found omega plus one so interesting. Later on, in my other mathematical studies, I learned uses of understanding well-ordered sets that improved my intuition of the countable cardinality of rational and algebraic numbers, dedicant cuts, and the least upper bound property in real analysis, the strength of ordering elements in Euclidean domains, and more. Sorry I didn't get time to get around to making the video for my favorite finite mega number. I've got a script, but not a video, and It'll be on its way soon. If this piqued your interest in set theory, then I recommend reading the Naive Set Theory book by Paul R. Halmus. It's a good first text in set theory if you really want to get an understanding of the scope of how much it can do, as well as how some of the nitty gritty details can get messy without having to actually go into all of the nitty gritty details right out the gate. It's also rather light on notation. In fact, most of the time it reads like a normal book. I like to share it with students to show that math isn't all about numbers. 
trust me, it does a lot with 114 pages, and it's less than 10 bucks, so yeah. Thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed the video, and remember to like, subscribe, and watch all the other wonderful favorite mega number videos.